were pushing from the left. Those weeks at gunnery school are flashing through his mind. to uh, tell everybody where you were born? Yeah, I was born in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. And uh, who were your parents and what were their... Uh, well, my parents were Alice and Dwight Wood. My father uh, was a uh, member of the Army in World War I. Uh, he enlisted at age 17. He uh, lied a bit about his age. He was in a farm out in Kansas. Uh, for the summer, and when the war came along, uh, he got away with enlisting uh, a year before he should have, of course, and had quite a, an amazing experience in the Army. He was a dispatcher and drove uh, the messages at that time to the front lines from headquarters. So he, in his discharge, you can see, was in every major battle you ever read about in World War I, and uh, amazing that he survived it because of his position and what he did. But he had a lot of close calls. Yeah. What about your father's experiences coming home? When, when were you born uh, Well, your father came home? Yeah, I was born in 1925, and... Uh, my dad uh, evidently had uh, maybe a falling out, we'll call it, with his father. They had some disagreements that got pretty serious. And he left for the war. He left for the uncle's, his dad's brother's farm out in Kansas, and that's what happened. He was there when the war started, and that's when he enlisted. And it's interesting, uh, the story that my grandmother told me, his mother, was that he and his father hadn't spoken for a long time. And, of course, being in all those battles, things changed. His attitude changed. I'm sure his father's attitude changed. And if you think about uh, what it was like for him when he came home, uh, survived the war, and I guess his dad was out cutting the lawn walked up behind him, tapped him on the shoulder and said, hi, Dad. Tough, a tough uh, experience, but they became really close after that. And as long as his dad was alive, they were very close from that point on. I imagine his dad had a lot of pretty strong feelings as a result of their arguments. What about uh, siblings? Do you have? I have you none. Have no, no, I have none. My mother was unable to have uh, more children. I was the one and only, and uh, I guess was pretty fortunate for me uh, to be born the way I was and survive that. And uh, she was unable to have any more children. What about um, your your early education? What do you remember about? Um, primary, secondary. Well, school, my, my memories of my education are uh, one of the fun things, uh, funny things that happened uh, during, of course, my lifetime. I was born during the Depression, and uh, my father worked in a bank, and uh, when the bank closed, uh, there was absolutely no work for him. And he tried so hard to find something, but could find nothing, and finally found a job in Texas with a stove company. And so he went to Texas to go to work, and my mother and I uh, got in our Model A Ford and went to Texas, and we were there one week when the company closed due to 
the Depression. So we came back to Columbus and uh, he was pretty desperate from what I understand because there was absolutely nothing for him to do that, that he could find. And in that kind of work that he did, uh, you could imagine how impossible it was to find a job. So he, because of his work in Kansas on that farm, he loved the farming. He actually uh, first took a job with the American Legion. He and my uncle were very active in the American Legion and they had a, a big log house out in the middle of nowhere that they considered their country club. And they gave him a job to manage that. So first he went out there to manage that. We moved in to the, to the log house. And uh, as you can imagine, the uh, chinking in the logs was not too good. And in the winter, it was pretty cold because the, the air kept blowing in where I had a bed and uh, the parties were on Saturday night, and I f understand, I was told that my mother became a little concerned about the American Legion Saturday night parties, and so she kind of uh, gave him a hard time until he found a, f a little place to rent that had l enough land that he could farm. So we rented this place, and uh, he grew uh, corn and wheat, and my mother canned vegetables. We had a big vegetable garden, and uh, the neighbor across the road, uh, he had uh, horses, and he, he raised corn, but he had wonderful beef cattle. So he and Dad made a deal. We got the beef from him. We supplied vegetables and got through the Depression uh, with that kind of an exchange beef from the farmer across the road and vegetables from us. So worked out pretty nicely. Uh, my schooling is what you ask about and that's how it started in the country and the little one room schoolhouse that was there was kind of an historic site has recently been torn down. But all the grades were in one room. Each row was a different grade and I can uh, I had a, an ability to spell. It was kind of a natural gift that I had, and I would win these spelling bee contests. And, uh, and so I always kind of felt like I was doing pretty well in school until we finally moved into the city. My dad was able to reconnect uh, with a real estate company. Uh, he went in there to financial and ended up within a year managing the company. He would, it was very, he was very bright, but uh, uh, had no opportunity until that moment. But uh, when I went to school, I can remember coming home from elementary school, talking about this strange thing of numbers, and of course I had absolutely no knowledge of arithmetic at all. And uh, because of this school didn't bother with that one row was more spelling than arithmetic. So I had to start learning about arithmetic at a strange age, but uh, it all in a year or two worked itself out and all was well. Uh, going back to the depression, did you have any, or, or to childhood before you were in the service, did you hold any jobs or work anywhere while you were growing up? Well, I started, uh, when we moved into the city, uh, I was old enough to uh, to work, so I sold uh, cookies door to door. I had an aunt who was quite a baker, and she baked uh, wonderful cookies. And so I started uh, my first experience with selling cookies door to door, and that was a pretty successful venture until uh, I think she became tired of the amount of volume that uh, cookies that I was able to sell. So that. That then turned into an opportunity that I had to uh, get a magazine route. The Saturday Evening Post was coming around neighborhoods at that time, recruiting kids to uh, sell magazines. And of course, we had no sporting equipment, so I took a magazine route, and my good friend, the neighbor, took a Liberty magazine route, and so we sold magazines and uh, we're able to get, instead of money, we could get prizes. We'd get 
balls or baseballs and footballs and and gloves and things that we could use. Uh, of course, we we're playing in the street in those days, uh, playing games of baseball and the things that you know kids played. So that that was the beginning of the work until I reached an age and a size where uh, one of the kids that lived in the neighborhood, he and I formed a, a lawn service company, and uh, we had quite a nice business. Uh, mowing lawns and taking care of uh, raking leaves and uh, just in that one area of the neighborhood. So we started early uh, with with a business which later on led me to to uh, start a summer cleaning business. That was when I bought my first uh, 38 Ford and uh, started a, a home cleaning business in Clintonville and it was pretty prosperous. Thank you. We'll get uh, we'll get into the service now. Can you tell us about when you went into the military? Were you yeah. Drafted? Did you enlist? In well, the I uh, uh, when I was came home from church on Sunday the seventh, I was sitting in front of the radio when I heard about Pearl Harbor. And a short time after after that, uh, when I was seventeen years old, on my seventeenth birthday, as a matter of fact, I went to Lockburn. Air Force Base and enlisted in the Air Force. I wanted to uh, fly, I wanted to be a pilot, and uh, got the scores to uh, qualify as a pilot or a bombardier or navigator is the way they did it in those days. But I had to wait till my 18th birthday and I graduated early from high school so that I could uh, enter the service. Now I was 18 in December and uh, in February, I got my notice and uh, was able to go in the service at that time into basic training. Okay. Um, why did you join? Why did you choose to? Well, I think at that service? time, and maybe it's hard for, for us today to realize, but what it was like with the, the power of, of Germany and Europe, I think the publicity that we had uh, in spite of what some people might feel today, there was deep concern over Germany and what a difficult time England would have to stand against Germany. At least my father and the family, my family, was deeply concerned about that. And when the Empire of Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, there was fear uh, everywhere. Kind of hard to recreate that today, but I think there was a feeling that Japan would in, be invading California after Pearl Harbor and there was great fear. So most of us my age, most of the young boys my age were anxious to get in the service to defend America. It was pretty simple. Yeah. What, uh, what things did you leave behind when you went into the service? Um, what, what strikes you as something that you left behind when you joined the, the Air Force? Well, I suppose, uh, you know, when being an only child, the family and the, and the dear friend that, that I had there in the neighborhood uh, was, was difficult. And being in high school, uh, I had a lot of friends in high school. I was on the track team and I was in the band and played in the orchestra and had a lot of friends, was in clubs there in high school. So with the group that we had in junior high school that went on to high school, we had a very tight-knit, close group of friends. And you could see your friends that were a bit older that were going into the service ahead of you. Uh, it was the thing to do and the thing that, although many waited for draft, uh, the friends I had were all enlisting. So we all went at about the same time in different branches some of them, uh, you know, in the Army, some in the Navy, some in the Marines. I did have a good, really, a close friend that was older than me that had gone in the Marines and was in the South Pacific. So uh, I kind of had it in my mind that that would be some place I'd want to go. I had no idea how quickly I was going to be there. Yeah. You mentioned that you chose the Air Force. Why? Yeah, why the Air I Force wanted to fly. fly. Okay. I really had this desire to fly. And, uh, you know, I knew what plane, I knew the planes 
that were available and I knew what I wanted to fly and uh, qualified uh, with my test. At that time you could be a pilot, a navigator, a bombardier and I went in of course to be a pilot and the reason I ended up uh, uh, so quickly in the service is they closed the school. I was in uh, basic training down in Keesler Field in Mississippi and they called us in those of, that had qualified to be pilots and said the school has been closed but you're qualified for combat uh, so you may select what would be your next choice. Well, what I didn't mention is that I grew up on this farm and I, my dad was a hunter. My grandfather was the greatest uh, shot I ever had known then or since. Uh, he had a collection of guns and uh, he was a dentist, very strict man, and taught me how to shoot uh, with my BB gun and then a 410 on up uh, as I got older how to shoot. And uh, some of the funny things that I remember is my, he and my dad uh, had a friend in the country uh, that owned a farm that was good to hunt. And uh, my grandfather had an old uh, Damascus twist double barrel gun, 32 inch double barrel that he was incredibly accurate and when we'd go hunting and there'd be a bird of course my dad and the farmer would shoot and when they'd miss I can still see my grandfather saying are you boys done shooting yet and he'd pull that big Damascus up <laughs> and the birds had come down so he taught me how to shoot how to lead movement, how to lead, you know, rabbits and, and, and flying things like pheasants. So I enjoyed that and I was pretty good at it. So when we were called in and said, you're qualified for combat, I signed up for aerial gunnery. And uh, I guess the, the luck that I had is when we got to Texas, we went out into the desert to shoot. Well, of course, I had I had good scores and all my friends, uh, I was with a group of guys uh, 18 years old that never had their hands on a gun. So uh, I can remember that master sergeant with his big board saying, that man's qualified to be a tail gunner. And I was, of course, had no idea what that meant and I was very proud. <laughs> Little did I know. <laughs> so that's how that came about for me and I ended up uh, in gunnery and it turned out there was a, uh, an experienced crew flying out of the Aleutians and they were regular army. And the tail gunner on that crew uh, had 19 years of service, became ill and they retired him. So they reached out and pulled me out of school and rather than going through the normal routines, uh, I was immediately available to fly and they were assigned uh, the South Pacific. So we went to, I think, Keesler Field, uh, from Keesler Field to uh, a field in Massachusetts. Uh, kind of forget the name of that field, but uh, we were there a short time. We came together, we had a couple of practice missions and we were then off to California. and. Uh, when we were assigned to go to New Guinea, I got tonsillitis and the flight surgeon wouldn't let me fly. So I got, I was kind of hung back a little bit, which uh, <laughs> was, we look at today and smile and say was, was a real gift because it was in Hawaii. <laughs> so I was there without any one to report to and had an opportunity uh, there to, relax and enjoy myself a bit and then when I did get to New Guinea I thought boy these guys are going to be so glad to see me because we developed pretty nice relationship. Well the first one saw me when I come off of the plane and he said oh hell Woody's back and uh, I thought why is that? Why do they feel that way? Well of course I learned quickly that they weren't allowed to fly missions without a tail gunner, so these guys had a nice vacation. 
in a vacation in a camp about as big as this house in New Guinea. It was not a vacation, but they thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what other memories of, of your training do you have? What, what stands out to you as something that happened during your training to be a tail gunner that, uh, that, you, that you'd like to share? <laughs> well, I don't think of the training was was very fast. I think the only thing I remember really about the training was uh, in a flight uh, over the North Atlantic uh, at night, uh, we were told that we had an engine problem and we're going to have to bail that the plane was uh, in deep trouble. So I can remember going to that back hatch from the in the tail and opening that and looking at that light, we had a system that we, could, we couldn't we could wear chutes uh, in my position, so we would clip a chute on and kneel down over that open hatch to bail out. And my memory is that it was pitch black. I'm not, I can't remember anything more black. Looking down, knowing that we're over the cold North Atlantic, not being able to see anything, and waiting for that light to go on to jump. And I can re I remember that. Uh, that's my memory of, of, uh, of my training, which was short. We didn't get a lot of training. But we ended up landing at a fighter base in uh, Maine, Bangor, Maine. And here we are in this big B-24 in Bangor, Maine, which is a fighter strip. And we had to take everything out of that plane that we could get out of it that had any weight. And we took off on that fighter strip in Bangor, Maine and cleared the trees and were able to get back to the base at, uh, you know, I think it was the field there in, in Massachusetts. Keesler Field, was it? Or I can't recall. Okay. Um. That was my only memory of training. Our training was yeah. very quick and, and very short. Yeah, that's, a, that's definitely a powerful memory. Um, let's see, what, was, what do you think was the hardest thing, uh, the hardest part of the training? Do you remember a hardest part? I don't, really. I, I enjoyed the shooting. I really uh, I felt good about uh, the training for shooting. I, I enjoyed that. I liked it. And uh, I seemed to have a, a knack for that, and uh, I, I was comfortable with it. I don't recall anything negative about that, and it was pretty short-lived. <laughs> what about um, what about the easiest and hardest part to adapt to being in the military versus being, you know, a, a young kid growing up? Well, I suppose. Uh, I suppose the people, there were an awful lot of people of different types and classes that I had not experienced in the life that I had uh, living in the country, then in that uh, north end neighborhood, then going into the service and moving so quickly from basic training to the gun training on, on uh, to the crew. Uh, I guess trying to at 18, with little background and experience, uh, I'd say we had no experience necessarily socially. We didn't have a lot of social experience. We did have a group that met in junior high school and high school. We did date. Uh, we dated. We had, you know, went to dances and things of that type, but we weren't what you'd call experienced uh, uh, with, with women. So that, that was a major, maybe the major change for us at, at 18, going into the service and uh, learning and hearing an awful lot that we didn't know very much about. I guess that's a common experience for young men. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, what about... Um what about your, your time after training? So where, where did you serve um, when, you were, when you were finished with your training? Uh, when I finished with the training, uh, I immediately, because of the crew that had picked me up, uh, we were immediately assigned to the 5th Air Force and uh, were off to New Guinea. So I actually turned 19 on the way to New Guinea 
So I moved uh, pretty quickly through the what we call basic training. I really didn't have very much basic training and and not a lot of flight training. So it uh, for me it things moved pretty quickly because of that crew picking me up, uh, the regular army crew picking me up as a tail gunner. And what about um, what about service in combat? What um, what are some of your your recollections of of your time in service when you were when you were flying missions? Well, you know those are not good memories. The uh, I suppose if you I I can look at it and laugh today. Uh, my job as tail gunner was I was in charge of armament, and. Uh, no question the most difficult job I had in the service was uh, the armament because although I didn't have to load the bombs, my responsibility was making certain that the bombs were released. And it was not uncommon over a target with heavy anti-aircraft fire for me to be called down the narrow little walkway in the open. <laughs> open uh, Bombay with all the stuff coming up and my uh, job was to stand there on that catwalk and, le and lean, <laughs> lean over and pull the pins on the bombs. I hated that job, hated it. It was uh, nerve-wracking because there was no space, hardly enough space to stand and with the open bay and uh, the junk coming up uh, it seemed like in your face, whether it hit or not, was it seemed close. Trying to reach over and pull those pins to get those bombs out of there. Uh, so I hated the call, Woody. It's bombs are hung up again. <laughs> yeah. I did not like that call, and that happened often. So uh, I'd find myself on that catwalk many times, and uh, I fortunately I survived that. There were lots of hits that. Near misses. You mentioned being really connected with your crew yeah. that you served with. Can you speak a little bit about the camaraderie or how you got how you developed that closeness with the crew? Yeah, we had a wonderful crew, and uh, the uh, I was very very fortunate in that the the key members of the crew were regular army. Uh, the lots of training. The pilot was uh, he was a. When we went over, of course, everyone was a, a second lieutenant, but uh, you know he, he was a first lieutenant, quickly promoted to major because of his time in the service and his effectiveness. He, he was one smart guy. He was not, uh, not the most well-liked person in the group. He, uh, we had an expression for those kind of guys, and I liked him, he liked me, but uh, he, he was pretty strict. He was a kind of a chicken shit type of guy that uh, did, was not popular in, among other uh, officers. And we had the greatest guy on the crew to me was the master sergeant who was chief engineer. He and I became great friends, and uh, we worked closely together, and he was very, very helpful to me, and we had a very, very effective crew. Uh, we survived a lot, and uh, a lot of it was because of our the effectiveness of the people that were on the crew and could do the job they were assigned to do. Were they from all over? The yeah, States? they. The uh, chief engineer was from uh, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and uh, the others. Uh, there was a two of them from Boston, the radio operator and the nose gunner uh, who never was able to fire his guns. He, uh, he was from Boston and crew uh, from Ithaca, New York. The bulk turret gunner was from Ithaca. The waste gunner was from Syracuse, New York, where I moved after I was married. So he and I had a nice, nice time together there. Yeah, did you, that kind of leads me into the next question, so did you keep, did you keep those close relationships? <laughs> yeah, I did with, uh, with several of the people, and not with the, uh, not with the flight crew as much as with the, the uh, ball turret gunner and the waste gunner 
and I stayed in touch our, most of our lives. And uh, the others uh, drifted away and uh, we kind of lost touch with them. The pilot did not maintain touch with anyone, but I did maintain a relationship with the chief engineer who was from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, ended up uh, mayor of Pine Bluff and was an amazing, amazing man who we had a lot of fun experiences during the war with. Could you, would you feel comfortable relating one of those humorous experiences that you had with the members of the crew during your time? In yeah, the I, uh, a couple of funny things. Uh, one that toward the, uh, we had some fun things happen during the war and toward the, uh, when the war was over, I was on Okinawa. The crew ended up on Okinawa. We we're flying missions out of Okinawa on Japan. And uh, when the war ended, the chief engineer, Sam, wanted to uh, improve his, his living. And he was tired of living in this tent where we were, so he decided that he would make a deal. Sam was a man that made a lot of deals wherever we were. So Sam made a deal with a sailor to go out at night and he was going to drop some, this guy was going to drop some lumber off of this transport ship down onto our duck. So he rented a duck from the motor pool and when the war ended I was put in charge of the motor pool so I had in charge and I arranged for Sam to have a duck and he said well you go along with me. So I did and on the way out to the ships in the harbor, I went to sleep on a coil of rope in the back of the duck. And when I awakened, they're lowering this great <laughs> net full of lumber down on, looked like it was coming right down on top of me. And, and uh, we, we both had a, a great laugh about that because Sam uh, built his base for his tent and after we got it built, some officers didn't like the idea of Sam having such a good, good uh, living conditions. They made him tear it down and go back to his tent pitched on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but that was something he and I laughed about. And you know, Sam was a guy that started a started a crap game and had a table with uh, and took a piece of oil cloth and painted out the. Uh, the system for, for a dice game, and uh, Sam was, was into that kind of thing. Older, he was older and uh, probably could have retired, but didn't. And uh, he was very much into the same thing the rest of us were winning that war. Um, I heard an interesting story about, uh, from John Hoberg, about um, you shooting a pig. Oh. <laughs> We were, of course, living off 10 to 1 box rations, and uh, Cookie said to me one day, Woody, I understand there's, there's some, some uh, pigs out there in that jungle. Someone said they saw one. He said, if you'd go out there and get us a pig or two, he said, I would build a spit, and he said, we could have some fresh meat, and we wouldn't have to be living out of these boxes. So... I said, that sounds like a good idea. So I went over and checked out a shotgun and took uh, the guy, that friend, uh, who was the waste gunner. And so we go out and we're waiting along in this jungle. And my God, the next thing you know, I'm looking at the meanest looking boar you've ever seen in your life, like these pictures you've seen of these things. And I didn't like the looks of that boar, and I thought, I said, Waters, I'm not going to, this shotgun isn't going to do it. So I fortunately had my sidearm. I pulled, pulled out the 45 and took care of the boar, and the pigs were there. So we shot these pigs, and we brought them in, and sure enough, this guy had some fellows, and they dug a big pit, and, and they built a spit. So we gathered all the beer we could find in the area, everyone jumped in and, and uh, contributed the beer, and we had this huge party. This guy cooked these pigs over the spit, and it was really good. It was amazing how good it was, and we ate to our heart's content. Problem is, 
uh, we did not fly a mission for about 10 days. Everyone was so sick after that that no one could hardly <laughs> get away from the, from the John. The latrine was a very busy place. Well, the flight surgeon told me later, he said, I don't think probably wasn't anything wrong with the pigs. But he said, you can't live on 10-1 rations very long and then all of a sudden have a lot of fat, fresh meat. So, uh, but we had a lot of laughs over that, but uh, we, we got into some trouble about it too because we, uh, we couldn't fly any missions for, for quite a few days and that did not make uh, leadership happy. <laughs> but the little they could do about that. Was there anything that you did for good luck before missions that you flew, before your, your flights? Uh, no, not really, not really. I had a strong faith and uh, uh, I, did, I did my prayers at night and in the morning and we flew every day. And I suppose uh, it's one of those things that, that uh, those of us that, that had that faith felt very comfortable with. And we had an officer, an interesting experience that I look back on and say, you know, it worked pretty well. It sounds pretty harsh now. But we were called in one day, this, the, uh, all the gunners were called in one day and in this meeting, this man in a very dramatic way looked at us and he said, you're dead. You are dead. You're dead. You are going to die. Just consider yourselves dead. And if you feel that you're dead and forget the fact that you're going to have some life in the future, it'll be helpful to you. Just relax and know you're already dead. And it sounds terrible to say now. It was terrible at the time to hear that, but it worked. And I think a number of us said, you know, we need to just relax because what we're facing, uh, it's true. You know, we're not going to come out of this where, where we are and what we're doing uh, with the losses we're having. Uh, we might as well relax and enjoy it. And it made a difference. It sounds ridiculous now when I look at it now, maybe a, a little older and perhaps a little more educated, but... Uh, it worked, and it took a lot of the heat off. And uh, I found myself and others, we talked about it, others found themselves not nearly as concerned. We had a similar mindset. Oh, did you? Mindset yeah. Too before, before we went overseas. Yeah. yeah. A very similar uh, mindset. Um, you've, you've talked to me in the past about uh, the younger guys coming in, the replacements yeah. coming in. Yeah. While you were overseas, can you can you speak to that? Yeah, I had uh, my my job uh, was to kind of work with the tail gunners uh, after I'd been over there and and had uh, 12, 14 missions. So I would work with new crews, replacement crews that come in uh, with that. But I had one. I did have one. Uh, experience that's hard to, difficult. Uh, we had this new crew come in. They had a, a new B-24. It was a, it was a model we hadn't seen that had all wonderful equipment, very modern equipment. They had things that we hadn't seen before. These guys, they had heated suits plug-in heated suits, and they had a different kind of armor. Their turrets moved a, a lot uh, more smoothly. Uh, it, it was quite an improvement. So I immediately got acquainted with the uh, tail gunner, and I suggested we had some space near our tent. I suggested they pitch, the enlisted men pitch a tent uh, near ours, and they did. And uh, so we, we got acquainted. Uh, pretty well acquainted, and uh, this guy had just turned, he just turned 19, and it seemed as ridiculous now for us now when we look back on those things and how, how it, uh, 
at that age, you would felt someone was so much younger. Uh, I wasn't that much, <laughs> that much older, but you felt that, and I suppose you were in a lot of ways. But uh, gave them all the information we could, gave them all the tips we could, and I had I had come back just before they went out with us. I had come back from. Uh, a mission that I was being teased that that uh, they told me I was grossed out and it was a bad we had a bad mission we had a lot of anti-aircraft fire and the next day when we went back to the plane we were told that plane couldn't fly we had to fly in a different plane and that's how I got involved with volunteering to fly on some other crews why I ended up with so many more missions but uh, he had said I was grossed out, and it turns out I had over, he counted over 144 holes in between my turret and the tail of the B-24, he counted up to 144 holes, and he said, you know that, uh, you've been grossed out, and I lost the glass in the turret. Uh, I, c I can remember getting hit on the bottom of my boot, like somebody hit me on the bottom of the foot, didn't even, didn't even break the sole of the boot, and I never got a scratch. There wasn't any glass left in the turret, and the ship was full of holes from probably the midsection back when they quit counting, and uh, that was the luckiest moment of my life. So I'm training uh, this new tail gunner, and it turns out they flew on our right wing on their first mission, which was nice because we were able to wave and talk about the, being out on your first mission. And before we got hard over the target, they were hit. Uh, our theory is that they got hit in the gas, their da gas tanks, which they were carrying extra gasoline for the mission and they're Bombay at the same time. It's the only time I've ever seen a ship hit like that, but it went up in, a, in the tr proverbial million pieces. The ship, I've never seen anything like it. We even took damage from it, and of course everyone on that plane was destroyed. So that 19-year-old was lost on his first mission. I'll never forget that. And uh, it turned out, there, it turned out to be quite a story because uh, some years later there was a, a B-24 that came to Bolton Field here in Columbus. It was the first time I remember that happening and I had to go see it. My wife said, you need to go out there and see that plane. So I went out and uh, I thought I'd had a bad experience getting in a B-24, so I thought, well, I don't want to get in it. But when I arrived, I had, a, I had my hat on. The guy that was in charge said, uh, you're a serviceman. I said, yes, yeah, I'll go on in. Don't pay. And so I went in, I got on the ship, and I got up into the airplane and felt fine. Uh, I, <laughs> I couldn't get in the tail. Uh, I changed in shape a little bit. I couldn't drop myself down on that tail turret and decided I didn't want to fight that. But uh, I enjoyed going through the plane and looking at the plane and, you know, reminiscing as a result of that. But you won't believe this. When I got off of the plane, there was a woman that had been standing there with a clipboard. And uh, she said, uh, were you... Uh, on one of these planes in the war? And I said, yes, I was. She said, where were you? And I said, well, I was in the South Pacific in World War II and, and flew a lot of missions in, in an airplane like this. And she said, I had a, I had a son uh, that was in this same kind of airplane and he died when he was 19 years old and described where he was and the unit he was in. And it simply had to be, it simply had to be uh, the same person. Now, if you can imagine how she felt and how I felt and what could I say? 
that was the most dramatic experience that I think I had since, you know, since the war ended. And to think that uh, that I would run into someone like that, it was, it, it was unforgettable. How, how did you, uh, how do you think the war or your time in combat and your time in the military changed you? Well, I suppose it's hard for each of us to know, to know that, but uh, I think there was a maturity that occurred with me and with, with those that I knew uh, and I think something happens happens to us, uh, Pat. That's hard to describe. There is a uh, there is a kind of uh, I suppose a in our life a, a gentleness that we know when we're young. Uh, the relationships we have with people uh, is 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 a particular kind and type. And that changes. I think that changes. And when you think of the the lecture we got about your dead, uh, something happens to you. I think beyond the fact that you're not going to worry so much about being hit when you're flying missions, or if you're in a tank, or you're if you're manning guns. No matter what you're doing, uh, there is an incivility that I think occurs in the military that's hard for us to. Uh, to explain, it's to me, it's it's almost kind of a mystery. Uh, it's as if, you know, one day you're you're 17 years old and you're turning 18 years old, and maybe you're trying to con your mother a little bit into making her think that you're uh, you've learned some manners and that that you're you know maybe you're you you've grown up. Uh, proper and you've listened to your mom and dad and the next day you're a killer. You're a killer. You're learning how to kill and you get good at it. You get good at it and you want to get better at it. And if anyone thinks that doesn't have an impact on a person, uh, they're just kidding themselves because it has a hell of an impact. It has a big impact. It affects your life. And it, uh, it goes deep and it goes into places that are hard to manage. And the feelings that you get at times when you start thinking back on your experience, hard to manage. It's hard to manage. But uh, those are the changes, those are the differences, and I think the difficulty I think a lot of us had getting back home uh, was trying to reorient ourselves into a culture, into a society uh, with the language for one thing was, was pretty bad in the military. We joke about it, we can laugh about it, but it was pretty bad, it was pretty tough, and all of a sudden you're back into a society where uh, killing what the most important thing, uh, trying to be a nice guy was more important than the killing and learning how to kill. You're tr trying to learn how to live and try to learn how to be a citizen again. There's a transition there that comes about that we don't talk about a lot. But it's there and it's tough. And uh, for some people, it's not manageable. Okay, Vic. So we talked about um, your transition and what and and the the trouble of being a killer and then coming back home and being a yeah a citizen again. Yeah. Can you, can you talk about some of the things that you did personally to transition? Yes, I had. Uh, I should tell you that uh, what what happened to us uh, first of all is that. We had this horrible typhoon that was the, I guess, the, probably the most powerful typhoon in, in history in that part of the world. And it destroyed everything in its path and it was, Okinawa was in its path. Any ship that was not uh, out of the harbor was destroyed. Ships were driven up on top of other ships. It was, it was pretty bad. And after that storm, it destroyed the, uh, 
pretty much everything, in, including the, for the first time that I ever saw, the organization of the military was pretty well destroyed. We were told to get off of the island, and of course, being in the Air Force, it was to go back to Hickam Field. And there were a handful of bombers that they said had been checked and not destroyed that uh, we could ride in, so I hitched a ride on a B-24. I don't know the crew, I didn't know any of the people on the ship, but I jumped on with some other guys and we took off and we refueled after about five hours. I think we stopped at Guam or Wake and, and uh, refueled the plane. About five hours out after refueling, we lost a, an engine, an outboard engine on the right. And we, of course, began to lose altitude when we lost a left inboard engine. So we're flying a B-24 full of guys uh, on two engines and we're losing altitude pretty fast. There was no longer ships. The Navy no longer was alternating to pick up flyers because the war was over. So we were in trouble and we were going down and knew that uh, there was no hope uh, for us. There was no, no ships or, and B-24s didn't float. Uh, B-17s would stay afloat for some time. B-24s went straight down. So we were lost and when the navigator told us uh, that he had discovered on the map a speck that was called Johnson Island. He said, I think it's a coral reef, and if we can get near there, maybe, you know, maybe somebody can survive the crash into the sea, and maybe they can swim. Well, you know, that's kind of a joke. When you see the size of the Pacific Ocean and you've been flying over it like we had, we all knew there's nobody's going to swim to an island. But anyway, uh, we kept going, hoping that maybe we'd get close enough. Believe it or not, we made it. We're flying down over the water for some period of time. We're close to hitting the water when he hit that white coral beach. And I, my memory is with the back hatch open so we could jump out, uh, I saw this white coral. I'll never forget that look of that white coral when we hit that and he made a perfect landing and of course the personnel was on that land were terrified and they all took off for the opposite end. They all ran the wrong direction and uh, which was kind of funny. We laughed a lot about that later but we got to that uh, reef and landed safely and it's an interesting story because it was a sub-refueling base and they had PBYs that patrolled for Japanese submarines, and they had engines in stock. Well, it turns out Continental built the PBY and Continental built the B-24 bomber. So we had an engine, we repaired one engine and we replaced the other engine. It took us a while and we all worked hard at that, but uh, the one of the men there on the naval personnel there was an engineer and he was sharp and we were able to get that plane flying and we got off of that that Johnson Island and got back to Hickam Field and uh, when we got there the pilot said he's going to refuel you can all get off and where we're assigned and told us where we were to go and he said no I'm staying on the plane I'm going to refuel and fly to San Francisco and not a single man got off of that airplane not a single one. We all flew on, got to uh, San Francisco, and I got on the train and, and headed back to Columbus. And I think I arrived like at three o'clock in the morning. And uh, shortly after I arrived home, uh, I signed up for school at Ohio State University for the summer quarter. And to answer your question, I wasn't in class very long until the professor asked me to stay, uh, if I'd stay after class one day and told me he didn't think I was well. He said, you don't look right, you drop off and you go, it seems like you go to sleep. And uh, so he sent me over to the Ohio State University uh, medical lab and I had a complete physical uh, and I found out that my thyroid was not functioning at all, wasn't functioning, period. 
So uh, they got that back and they told me I should take some time. So my uh, aunt and uncle had big farms down in the country, down in Ross County, and uh, the farms crossed the Paint Creek. And of course, growing up on the farms, as I did, uh, that was perfect for me. I loved that. In fact, I actually spent my summers there, even after we moved into Columbus, all my summers were spent on the farm from the day after school was out until the fair time when school started. So I was familiar, I knew everyone, and uh, that was nice for me to go down there and just be able to walk in that country and talk with some of the farmers I knew and just to have good food and, and rest. And I slept out on the sleeping porch and my uncle, who was very smart, had quite a library and he'd come out at night and we'd talk and he would read poetry and read stories and uh, uh, was uh, changed my life. And I went back to school and uh, was able to go back and stay in school. Let's see, so, so when you got home, um, your father was a World War I veteran, yes. correct? Yes, yes, so, yeah. So did you and your father ever share experiences? Did you and uh, your father ever talk One about time, it? one time um, he took me, he never uh, talked about the war, and one time he took me to a movie, uh, it was called All Quiet on the Western Front, and he took me to that movie, and on the way home, we stopped for ice cream, and he talked all the way home about the war and about his experiences, and he never, ever mentioned it again. But he told me an awful lot that night. It was amazing, the things he told me. Well, when I came back then, it was about six months, uh, I'd say about six months after I came back, and one night, he said, why don't we go out and have dinner time? My mother was doing something. So we went out to dinner and he started to ask me about the war and about my experiences and I pretty well laid out uh, my life in, during the war just like he did me that night. And we never talked about it after that. It's a strange thing. Uh, a night with him when I was a kid uh, after that movie and then that night that he and I were together and we just about talked it all out. It was pretty late when we got home and uh, he never mentioned it again. But it was funny when I got off of the train and I had this B4 bag. Of course, I hadn't, uh, I don't think I'd been in a shower for a while and I had clothes all faded from in the Pacific, your clothes uh, practically rot on you. Uh, it, it was really interesting. I went home, got in a tub, and I think I soaked in a bathtub for a few hours and took a bath and went to bed. When I got up the next morning, I didn't have anything. My dad took that bag full of stuff, <laughs> threw it in a big can someplace and burned everything. <laughs> he said, Dick, I think I... I caught your scent when you got off of the train before I even saw you. So it must have been a kind of a joke. He always made a joke about that all, all his life. He always joked about me getting off of that train and smelling me before he could see me. When you, when you got home, what, uh, what types of things were you excited to do? What were you most interested in? I guess seeing, uh, seeing my friends and uh, we would get together. We picked a place in Columbus that was close by that we would all meet. All the veterans would uh, meet. All the men who knew each other would meet in this particular restaurant and they had a big couple of big booze and we'd meet there and drink beer and talk and wait for the next guy to get home. And we did that for about a year, I think, until everyone finally got back back home that we knew in high school. It uh, was quite a it was quite a thing that we we did for a long period of time until everyone got back. And a lot of them of course didn't come home and uh, they were good friends that we always missed. What about um, 
your time after the service? What uh, what kind of jobs did you do? What what did you do for work after you got got home from the military? Well, I uh, I worked uh, before the military. I worked in in uh, <clears throat> nonstop from the time I started carrying magazines and and working uh, doing yards. Uh, I started, uh, before the war, I started a little uh, cleaning business in the North End, and uh, that turned out to be an interesting business where it cleaned. I had a, a big, tall kid who was a friend of mine was could clean the wallpaper, and the, re the other guy and myself could do things of that type that uh, cleaning. We had, we had a cleaning business, and that worked, and then... Uh, after after the war, I took a job uh, with a contractor uh, in the summer, and I took a job uh, during school with Western Auto Supply selling on the floor retail. And at the same time, I had a job at that time also banking the money at the Union Department Store along in High Street. Uh, I would when the store Western Auto would close, which was downtown on 4th Street, I would walk over at the union company there on High Street and uh, I had a job to go in and read the registers and put the money and cash in a bag and on a cart and I'd take it all up at the end of the day uh, when I'd collected all the money and read the registers, put the tapes with the money and uh, put the money in a safe and close the safe and go home. That was an excellent job, but it was a pretty well paid job, and I got it because I knew someone that worked there, uh, and it probably one of the better jobs I had. So I, I generally worked uh, all the way through school, and I had a job with a contractor one time that was just a labor. I just worked at, at labor jobs that were pretty, pretty well paid jobs, roofing jobs, and and high, some high work jobs, steeplechase, uh, all labor. And then later on in life, you you changed career fields. You, yeah, you uh, when I was well, when I was in college, I had the, some of the jobs I uh, described, and I had a job in a in a factory in the summer. I had a part time job in a factory that was a a job that was extremely routine, where I was picking up a, a photograph mount and shoving it into a machine to deckle the edges of the machine. And, and after a period of time, I decided that's not something I wanted to do, and I think it made me settle down a little bit in, uh, in school and maybe study a little harder. But uh, I did work from the time I was old enough to work uh, all the way through school, even though the GI Bill paid for the uh, books, tuitions, and fees, I always had worked. And I say that because it's something I think happened to an awful lot of us in our generation. And uh, it paid big dividends for me later, later in life. The learning experience I had was very helpful to me later in some of the work I did, some of the volunteer work I did. Um, what about, can you speak to, to some of the volunteer work that you did, um, specifically your, your work with Mary Haven, what led into that? Yes, I had, uh, I think the experience, uh, if I can just touch on the experience I had, I, I think most of us, uh, you're, you're a serviceman, you were in, uh, in combat, and I think the prayers, uh, that I, that I offered were answered. Uh, and when the prayers were answered there over the Pacific, when we went down on that island, I felt an obligation and I made promises to God. And uh, interesting enough, I have to say, to be honest, when I landed in San Francisco, somehow I immediately forgot all those promises that I made and I went ahead and I led my life and uh, I think uh, things were going along quite nice for me when 
without going into a description, I was reminded one night, <clears throat> late at night in a dream, and will say that uh, I had not kept my promise. And it turns out I had been working with a friend who had come to me for help. He had lost his job uh, in Texas. He had a high-ranking job in Texas in an executive position, and he admitted that he had lost it because of alcohol, that he couldn't stop drinking. And would I help him? Well, he didn't come to me because I had any kind of a reputation. I didn't know anything about alcoholism. But uh, I'd agreed to help him for reasons that's hard to explain. I agreed to help him. I had him come back uh, to see me uh, every day. And I said, just come back and let's talk. Uh, so he did that, and after about a month of that, things were going, I thought, pretty well. Uh, and he said to me one day, well, he just, he didn't think he wanted to do that anymore. He felt like he needed to, he really needed to continue to drink, that, uh, that drinking was going to be his life and that he was just going to give up. So I convinced him that he was not prepared to do that, that he needed to keep coming back. And what I did is I called the Riverside Hospital to meet with a woman who was the head of their drug alcohol program. And I had a friend who gave me that name and I went to her over lunch and told her what had happened. And I said, you know, I'm desperate. I need help here. Uh, I don't know anything about this. And she said, what have you been doing? And I told her, and she said, good Lord, you've just created the STEP program. And uh, it turns out things that I had done are pretty much uh, Bill's program on alcoholism treatment. So she convinced me that I would need to go to Mary Haven as a volunteer, and that's how that came about. And I realized at that time I was I guess becoming aware of the fact that my dream and my commitment was coming into being in one thing and that's what it was. And I felt like that if I can become involved, this would be what I was called to do and I felt very strongly about it. So I did go to Mary Haven and went through the program of training. Uh, even though I went as a volunteer, I still had to be trained as a counselor. But shortly after I was trained, I realized it was not just right for me. And uh, so I had gone to Gethsemane on a retreat. And during that retreat at Gethsemane, uh, I realized that my calling was a spiritual calling. And one of the priests at Gethsemane recommended that I apply to the Shalem Institute uh, for training, and I did that, was immediately accepted, and went through a two-year program of training as a spiritual uh, director, a spiritual advisor, and that's where I felt like my, now I felt like I had my calling for life, and went back to Mary Haven, and was as interesting enough assigned the Department for Women, and uh, that's where I began my work at Mary Haven, uh, seriously uh, with both alcohol training and then training as a spiritual advisor. So being a spiritual director there with the Department for Women gave a whole new dimension to the work that I began doing and uh, I decided I needed to get to branch out a little bit to get back uh, where I could be working with veterans. I felt a need I could see at that time. It became knowledge that an awful lot of veterans were suffering uh, from uh, PTSD and uh, maybe help, there could be some help. So I started working with, with these guys that I could, that would be referred to me that came in as veterans. And that was the beginning of my work with the veterans who were suffering at that time. And that went on for about 22 years. Uh, I, I had an office on Fifth Avenue. The interesting thing for you and I is that the office was provided by the man who provided our first money for Saul. 
and uh, I had done something that he thought was nice. He couldn't understand why I could or how I could do that and not be paid and he thought I should be paid and of course I wasn't accepting money. I was doing all this as a volunteer so he said well at least you should have an office. I agreed to that and he provided an office and and furnished it and uh, as long as I needed it until I was called over to the church to work in the church annex. Did you did you struggle with post-traumatic stress yourself? Yes. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. This? Yeah. I never. Uh, I'm not sure. You know. I'd like to think we get through it. We get over it. And I think we can get through it to a point where we can lead a, a pretty good, uh, if it's normal, if there's such a thing as a normal life. But there is something deep inside that can't change. Uh, so in my opinion, yes, uh, we get to a point where we're, we're well, but, but, uh, it's, there's always something, always something there that, uh, there's a calling there to us. Each of us in our own way, I think, has that moment where we break down. Okay, Dick, so if you're comfortable, I'd like to re-ask the question about um, your testimony of God and how that's impacted you um, since the service. Well, I think it's, it's always been, as long as I can remember, religion was an integral part of my life. I grew up with, with parents and family that were uh, always attended church, were very religious, and uh, it just seemed natural to me when I went into the service to carry that with me, and I did, uh, reading the Bible and uh, praying at night or praying over issues uh, was a natural thing for me. It's something that I suppose I didn't think much about. It was just, I just did it. And as the war progressed and as I flew more and more combat missions, it uh, became an integral part of my life. The prayers for, for me, for the crew, and for other crews and people I knew uh, just became something that uh, gave me a platform to stand on, particularly in the most difficult times. And I think when I come home and look back on the, the difficulty that I had in uh, coming back to normal life, uh, I think it was the, uh, the religious experience that I had that, that enabled me to, to go on and uh, to lead a, a more normal life, to get back to, to normal again. I think it was uh, the thing that ultimately uh, saved my life, and I think the the life that I led for over 20 years uh, was uh, one of the most comforting periods of my life was to be able to, to know how to do that work, to know that I could make a contribution to people that needed help, and to be able to do that, and to be able to do that without having to to be in business, to do it without having to charge a fee, that felt really good to me. It felt like I had maybe uh, tried to compensate a little bit and, and make up for the, for the joy and the good luck that I had. So God has always been very good to me. Thank you. Um, going back, I've got one kind of follow-up question. Um, synchronicity, are you familiar with that term? I've heard that term, yes, I've Did, heard that term. Would you mind uh, defining that? Do you have a definition for that? Not necessarily, but uh, you know, to me, the, the life that I've led and the things that I've shared with you would lead one to believe, and I think you can understand why I believe that uh, there is a tide in the affairs of man and that things come together in the right time and the right place. And that is the synchronicity for me in my life and uh, how that's all played out. Uh, I think it's uh, been kind of a fascinating story. Uh, definitely. Is there, um, is there anything you'd like to, to add or talk about that we haven't hit on during this interview? Well, 
I don't think so. I I think uh, I think we've we've talked about my military life pretty thoroughly. Yeah. It covers it pretty well, I think. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there anything that you would want to share for other veterans or service members? Um, that might be struggling with post-traumatic stress that you think uh, your experience could help them? The thing that that uh, I have actually begged, almost begged people to do is to talk, talk, talk about it. Bring it out and talk about it. And uh, not be too uh, too shy, not let your 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 masculine drives uh, prevent you from from letting it all hang out. And if you feel like crying, cry. And if you feel like you need to do what I thought when I come back, I shared with with uh, with you and your group one day that how did you feel? I could, when I got off of that airplane in San Francisco, I can remember in my mind, I wanted to find the biggest cornfield in the state of Ohio and go sit down in the middle of it and cry. Nothing else would do. Get it all out. And once you do that, it helps. Doesn't mean you won't do it again, because you might. But it really can make a difference in your life. Just don't hold it in. Talk about it. Talk about your childhood. Talk about your, your youth. Talk about the things that bothered you. Just talk. And find someone to talk to and tell everything you can think of. No matter how difficult it might seem, just talk about it. Find someone that'll listen. Uh, let's see. Oh, thanks, Dick. That was that was amazing. Um, what do you wish more people knew about veterans? I guess I wish more people realized what uh, veterans, no matter what their station in life, what they emotionally go through if in fact their service time brings them into combat. It's maybe uh, not the right thing to say, but I'll say it anyway. There's a difference between a veteran and a combat veteran. And if a combat veteran is someone that uh, needs some care and needs, we need to be concerned about them because of what we know, you and I know, having been there, uh, it's a big change. That's a big change that occurs in your life and the effect of, that it has on you needs to be discussed and you need to understand from people who know uh, how to deal with those feelings that you have and those thoughts that you have and how you can turn your life around no matter where you are. There are people out there that are waiting to help, wanting to help, know how to help. Just ask. You sure you don't, uh, can't think of anything else? You feel happy with, yeah. with how it's gone? Yeah, I think so. Would there be I guess I got to ask one more question. W would there be anything that you would want to share with your your children, your grandchildren, um, on tape? Well, I guess at the moment I I can't think of uh, of anything, but. Uh, I guess it's interesting to me that uh, when something 
regarding the war or veterans or the past, you know, this has kind of opened up something that was closed to me for a long time. And I'm at a, you know, a nice young age of 93. Uh, I think most about my grandchildren. I think a lot about them. And uh, I want them to know how important democracy is and what you do to keep it. How hard it is to keep and how important it is to keep. And a lot of people have paid a big price to keep it. And I want my grandchildren and great-grandchildren to know, know that. If there's anything I'd like for them to know, I've never said it to them, I guess. You can't very well, but I think a lot about my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I don't get to see them very much because uh, life is busy for people today. But I think about them a lot and just hope that they can know how important it is for them to maintain this thing we call democracy. It's worth it. And a lot of people have paid a big price for it. All right. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have any other questions unless you've got Okay, no, I, that's more than, <laughs> that's more than I thought I could.